Um, thank you very much for um, coming to the first ERI seminar for this year. Um, so our first speaker uh, for the seminar series is Dr. Robert Dean of Auburn University. Um, he will be talking about environmental and agricultural sensors. Um, as you know, all environmental research um, is fueled by data and collecting data through sensors is very important. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. It's, it's an honor to be here and to be the first speaker. Perhaps uh, click on the huh. That's not advancing. <laughs> Okay, thank you. All right, as an introduction, I'm just gonna walk around, that's how I teach, I don't sit. So, uh, we all know environmental sensors have many applications, including precision agriculture, pollution monitoring, weather forecasting, drought monitoring, food and water safety, et cetera. And our, our sensor requirements obviously are gonna be accurate and we like them to be very low cost, particularly if they're gonna be for disposable or one-time use sensor applications. So that's kind of where my focus is, is to, See, how can we make very inexpensive sensors? Uh, and to do that, I've turned to current circuit board technology. Now, my background for many years, I did MEMS research, microelectromechanical systems, including uh, sensors and RF, a bunch of different areas. Uh, they work really well in, in large quantities. They can be really inexpensive, but from a, a, a uh, you know, low quantity use application like a university, they're actually very expensive. If I send a student into our clean room to build a MIMS device, it's typically gonna cost me at least $10,000 uh, just for them to go into the lab and begin. And it'll probably take three months to have anything out if ever it works. So I started looking at other technologies. Uh, printed circuit board technology uh, affords viable low cost environmental sensors. And I think it opens the doors to many new applications. Uh, as we all know, uh, printed circuit board technology is a very low cost, mature technology. It's been around for many, many decades. It's used in most electronic systems now. Uh, the structure, I've got a diagram here, you basically have a, a rigid substrate that for, for, uh, for rigid ones, it's a, a electrical grade fiberglass called e-glass. Um, on top and below it and even inside of it, multi-layer ones, you've got pattern of traces. Uh, if you have exposed copper, they typically have a low corrosion surface finish. Uh, it could be plated tin, it could be gold, depending on the type of board that you get. Uh, surrounding everything but the exposed traces, you typically have a polymeric coating called solder mask that if you're soldering components, it limits the solder to just the exposed metal areas. Uh, I, I use that for other applications. You also have plated vias you can connect traces on different layers together electrically. And then of course you have attached electronic components and that's kind of an example of a circuit board. That was from a project uh, I had not related to this that my students designed and built electronics. So I also do that part of it too. Uh, with printed circuit board technology, you have many, many commercial manufacturers to choose from. Uh, they're typically for simple designs that are very low cost. You can get free design software to design your circuit boards. You can literally sit down at your desk in an afternoon, design board, order it. It shows up, you know, within about two to three weeks. It might cost you ten to fifteen U.S. dollars. So it's it's much cheaper, much faster than MEMS technology. So the question is, can we use this to make sensors? And I would say the answer to that is yes. So for PBC or PCB printed circuit board sensors. We want to use the low cost materials and commercial manufacturing processes they used to make multiple circuit boards. And to do that, we're going to design our traces on the board, whether they're exposed or whether they're insulated, so that they electromagnetically interact with the environment around the circuit board. And then that interaction will basically change the, the impedance of these traces. And then we can use that to back out what's going on in the environment. For example, we can measure parameters such as moisture content or materials in contact with the board. We can measure the conductivity of aqueous solutions the board may be dipped into. We can detect 
icing, um, we can look for chemical, chemical contamination, et cetera. Uh, also, because it is a printed circuit board, it's very easy to go through and add electronics to it directly. So that's something you can't really do with the MIMS device. And this is an example of just you know, a very small, uh, very low cost printed circuit board sensor, and that, that's a US dime. So you can make these small or large. So for our printed circuit board sensors, I mentioned you've got two types of uh, really electrodes. You've got those that are exposed to the environment, and those are useful for any type of, of resistive or conductive coupling, particularly through an aqueous solution. Then you've got those that are, that are insulated, where you can either do capacitive coupling or inductive coupling. And you can use that basically, once again, as your, your sensing technology. Now, there's three type of printed circuit board sensing elements. I'm gonna show examples of sensors from. You've got your exposed electrodes, and that's good for resistance or conductive sensing. You've got insulated, what they call interdigitated electrodes. It's like two um, hair combs interdigitated together where the tines are in between each other, but not touching. And typically that's gonna be up under the polymeric solder mass, and that allows you to do capacitive sensing. And then you can build these, these planar inductor structures and do magnetic sensing. I've got a couple of example sensors that I brought with me for some of the research I'm doing here. That's why it's got my university's logo and University of Wakato on them. So I'm gonna pass these around. Um, this is the conductive one. This is the magnetic one. And then this is the capacitive one. So I do wanna get these back, but I'll pass them around and see. And each of those sensors is about $3.50 in low quantity. So they're, they're relatively inexpensive. So let's talk about some sensor applications. First, I want to talk about using the exposed, ele the exposed electrode sensor. Uh, typically, they would have two exposed planar metal electrodes as shown there. Um, you could have more electrodes. There's some things you could do with additional electrodes, but the typical one would have two. And it's specifically designed to detect the electrical conductance when measured when the sensor is, is immersed in an aqueous solution. Um, you, can, uh, you can measure the sensor cell constant and convert your conductance readings over to electrical conductivity. And your electrical conductivity, or EC, is proportional to ion content if you calibrate for temperature, uh, at least for relatively low uh, dissolved ion concentrations, which is most applications that for environmental sensing. And they have equivalent sensors that are commercially available for measuring electrical conductivity, but typically they consist of two fragile parallel plate mounted uh, uh, electrodes, and those can be quite expensive and they're very fragile. Uh, as, as a planar electrode structure, it's very robust. Uh, you can, you know, you can take some and scratch it, but it, it works very well for a very long time. With, it, it'll, it'll take pretty rugged of use and still work. So a couple applications that I've done, uh, one of the early ones was for looking at drought monitoring in estuaries. Uh, of course, estuaries are confluent ecosystems in bodies of water between saltwater and freshwater ecosystems. And a saltwater gradient exists between the uh, onshore uh, freshwater that enters from rivers and creeks and then the uh, offshore entering saltwater. And when you have a drought, it basically disrupts that gradient, which affects the entire ecosystem. So what I want to do was develop a sensor where I can spatially, spatially measure the salt content, basically determine where is that salinity gradient and how has it changed. Uh, when salt dissolves in water, it affects the electrical conductance or electrical conductivity proportionally when you adjust for temperature. And therefore, if I put a lot of these sensors out there, I can actually measure the drought effects um, by basically measuring the conductance at a bunch of different locations. So one of the early PCB sensors I developed was for that application is a photograph of it. That one, um, I use the standard, just tin plated um, exposed electrodes. Later I switched to gold because I found a company that did gold for the same price. Uh, so this one would be a little more, more reactive in a, say, a coastal environment. But from the test that I did, I could not detect for short term use any difference between it and gold. So the results basically showed for um, percent seawater mixed with fresh water. I got a very linear uh, measure with conductance. So by measuring the conductance and calibrating, I can back out what is the percent seawater in, in the solution. And um, so it's a nice linear correlation, and it was very repeatable between different sensors. 
So, but all of these works I'm talking about are published and I, I'm, I'm linking my publications on there. Um, I'd be happy to send them to anybody who wants them, just let me know. So later work I did was to develop an easy sensor to improve sea turtle nesting research. Uh, sea turtle nest, nesting sites are particularly vulnerable to human interaction, uh, or, I mean, direct human interaction, also artificial lighting, as well as litter and pollution, and of course, roaming dogs. So really, all those are basically caused by humans. Uh, and nesting sites, therefore, are heavily researched. Uh, and typically, there's four metrics they look at. The temperature of the site, the moisture content of the sound around the sand around the site, the salinity of the sand around the site, and also the beach slope. The one I focused in on was improving the test for salinity of the sand. Now, for measuring the salinity of the sand, the typical measurement technique consists of going out there and collecting 50 grams of sand around the nest, drying it, then mixing it into 50 milliliters of deionized water, and then measuring the litter conductivity of the solution. And then once again, EC is proportional to the salinity of the sand when it's calibrated for temperature and, and, and for low uh, dissolved salt concentrations, such as what you would have in this application. And 50 grams of sand is a fair amount of sand. So my thought was, what if we could significantly reduce that? Uh, if we could reduce the amount of sand required, then taking that sample would result in less disturbance to a nest, or it would allow for more samples to be collected around a nest without increased disturbance. And both of those would be beneficial. So I developed a sensor for doing that. So this is the sensor I developed. It's also the same layout as one of the sensors I passed around. Um, this one I switched to a different low cost PCB vendor. Uh, so it, they actually plate all their exposed copper and gold. Uh, the company is Osh Park, it's a US company in our uh, Pacific Northwest. Each one of those sensors without the, connect, without the connector cost me about $3.57 in small quantities. Uh, from that, uh, comparing it to a commercial EC meter, I backed out the cell constant so I could convert conductance readings to EC readings. Then I adjusted everything to uh, sigma 25 means the EC at reference to 25 degrees Celsius. That's sort of the standard. I went through and did a bunch of calibration tests with sea salt and DI water to determine an equation to back out the mass of sea salt uh, based upon the uh, sigma 25 reading. That's the uh, equation for that. So now I have my sensor calibrated. So we actually went to a, an active nesting, sea turtle nesting site in the uh, Northwest Florida Gulf Coast near Fort Walton Beach. There's a photograph of it. As you can see, you know, they, they nest in regions where you have a lot of tourists. I mean, that's a multi-story condominium. It's condominiums up and down the beach. Uh, during much of the, of the day, this place would be full of people. And of course that keeps the, uh, so it keeps people out. The nest is inside of there. And um, that's another, that's what, that's what the coast looks like. We have very nice beaches around there, by the way. Except our, our water in the summer is more like bath water compared to here. <laughs> so we collected five sand samples in proximity to the nest. Uh, one was con uh, collected from sand under the seawater at about the time of low tide. One was from the intertidal zone uh, during the low tide, low tide period. One was from sand slightly above the high tide limit. One was from sand that was near sand dunes that was way above the high tide limit, and one was in close proximity to the active sea turtle nesting site. And um, from each of those, we collected approximately two grams of sand that, that we actually measured and got the exact mass. And with the sensor, we measured the conductance, converted that to EC25, we could back out the, sat, the salt mass, and then determine the ratio of, of mass of salt uh, per uh, a milligram per gram of sand and um, go through and get your readings there. And basically what we proved was that we could do these same tests with two grams of sand as opposed to 50 grams of sand. So we could significantly reduce the amount of required sand to get the same results. And this was, this was published um, recently at a, at a conference. Another project I've been involved in uh, for the past eight years, and this one's actually ongoing, uh, this was basically to, to see if we could apply my sensor technology to environments monitoring the environmental conditions at alpine and some alpine lakes. So this was a project that got approved by Rocky Mountain National Park and began working on in 2016. And what, what actually showed up was it became very effective at looking at the residual effects of forest fires. 
Um, in 2020, you had, in October 2020, you had the East Troublesome Lawn Wildfire and the Cameron Peak Wildfire, which were the two largest wildfires in Colorado history. Uh, they burned over hundreds of thousands of acres of, of forest land, including 30,000 acres inside the park itself. And I, I go every year and collect water samples from the lakes they've asked me to work in in late August. So this happened not long after I was there in 2020. Now, here's the sensor, and that, that should look familiar, but it's the same sensor I used last time. Uh, one of the things I do is I use the same sensors over and over, and just for new applications. So there's basically zero development costs to go from that project to this project. Uh, once again, it's the same sensor. Uh, the way I tested these, I brought the samples back to my lab, and I basically used a coaxial cable and connected to the SMA connector, and hook it up to the low frequency impedance analyzer in my um, in my lab. Even with the connector, the sensor is still under five dollars. So for sample collection, this is something I really couldn't send a graduate student to do. I have to go out and do this myself. So I go out there, and I, I stay in a cabin in the park. The, the park has been staying for free for about a week, and I do about a week's worth of hiking and I collect water samples at all these alpine and subalpine lakes. Um, I'm not sure what the highest elevation is here, but you know, there it's, the highest one is over 3,500 meters. So it's, it takes me a couple of days to adjust to the elevation. So of course I do that by hiking while I'm there. So okay. you haven't noticed I enjoy hiking. So I go out there and I collect water samples from all these lakes in 100, now it's 125 milliliter sample bottles. Now, the lakes they asked me to work at are in what's called the Lake Vale drainage in that watershed. And there's four lakes. You've got um, the Lock, Lake of Glass, Sky Pond, and Andrews Tarn. Sky Pond flows into Lake of Glass, which flows into the Lock. And there's a, a ridge that separates Sky Pond from Andrews Tarn, and Andrews Tarn also flows directly into the Lock. So they're all interconnected. Uh, this is actually a lot bigger than it looks. That's a fairly large glacier called Andrews Glacier. And um, it, it's, it has crevasses in it. People will actually go up there and ski down in the summer. So it's, it's a fairly large glacier. So it is it's bigger than it looks. And depending on the year, uh, that glacier may be a lot bigger than some years than others. Uh, it's somewhat small there compared to previous years, except it's bigger than the year before. Um, once again, it depends a lot on the temperatures that year and the precipitation and so forth. A lot also how much snowfall they had the previous winter. So here's my test data um, from 2016 through August of last year. And if you look at the EC for the three lakes, Andrews Tarn is that's the highest lake. It's always got the lowest EC. And, and by the way, some of the people I collaborate with that are at the USGS and also uh, a university out there have compared my results with their readings and they're all in the same range, which is some, some good correlation. But uh, when I collected my data in 2020, it was right before the wildfires occurred. And as you notice, the EC went up significantly in three of the lakes the next year, and went up further the year after that in all the lakes, and then it started going back down. So basically what happened is you're getting this ash fall that, that accumulated in the watershed, and you know, some of it directly went to the lakes, and others basically started flowing into the lakes. Now, the glacier, um, reduced significantly in 2022 compared to 2021. And of course the EC went up. So I'm thinking a lot of the material that got trapped in the glacier actually got into the lake that year. And here we are a couple of years later and it's still elevated, but starting to go back down. So I'm planning to continue this for two more years to see if it goes back down to this, I'll call that the baseline level. And there was actually, you know, fluctuation from year to year based upon if they were in drought or not, temperatures and so forth. A little more explaining the data. Uh, wood ash, principal constituents are calcium carbonate and potash. Potash dissolves in water. Calcium carbonate will dissolve in water if the water is saturated with CO2. So you're getting both of those in there. And the alpine lake water normally has a very low dissolved ion content. Pre-fire, uh, its ion content was not much higher than rainwater. Uh, the ash accumulation into the watershed is basically raised the in all four lakes. It's, it's remained elevated for the past three years. Now I'm going to be testing that. Now here's a photo I pulled off the internet showing what it looked like in the area while the fires were going on. So 
And I, I published some on some of the previous work in the early part of this project there. Next, we'll talk about uh, sensors using the insulated interdigitated electrode sensors. Uh, these are basically that planar interdigitated or IDE structure I mentioned before. It's like the two uh, hair cones that are where the tines are interdigitated together. Uh, that's a photograph of one of them, and this is a drawing of it. And basically, uh, with this type of structure, a sizable percentage of the capacitance between the two electrodes are due to the out of plane fringing fields. And when you have a material or substance that, that enters those fringing fields, that would be basically right above uh, the circuit board, if it has a, a dielectric constant or, or relative permittivity that's greater than air, it increases the capacitance. So this is very useful for measuring moisture content. Uh, this is something that sort of just demonstrates the sensor, but it's not really applicable to anything. Uh, you can actually use this to measure the mass of drop of water. Uh, the dielectric constant of water at room temperature is about 80. And the, the uh, polymeric coating, the solder mass, is mostly hydrophilic, so a, dro a drop of water tends to beat up on it. And with this type of sensor, the sensor's capacitance is literally proportional to the mass of the drop. Yeah, it's shown right there. Here is a fairly large drop after adding sort of the small drop and adding drops to it. Here's the measured, measured capacitance versus the mass of the drop of water. So, you know, from that, you can kind of speculate. We could use that to measure moisture content of soil or sand or other materials. And that's exactly what I started doing. Uh, one of the first applications was measuring the moisture content in soil. And of course, this could apply to agriculture, could be to drought monitoring, uh, construction. Actually, this first project I actually worked with our civil engineering department because they needed a sensor that would do this for construction purposes. Actually, what they were doing is they were experimenting with some material, some uh, chemicals to put at the ground to help with uh, liquefaction during earthquakes. And they wanted to use a radar system to go through and find out where that material flows before it hardens. And to do that, they needed to measure the dielectric constant of the soil. So that's where the sensor came from. And also we discovered it worked very well at measuring the moisture content. So with this type of sensor, and here's a photograph of that sensor, uh, the capacitance is proportional to, to the material's dielectric constant. And for air, that's about one. For dry soil, the dielectric constant was about 1.7 to 2.5. However, at room temperature, for liquid water, it's about 80. So by measuring the capacitance, you can estimate the water content. And here's a plot of our test data. And this was with a clay-based soil. And we measured the, the water content between zero and about 32.5% by weight water content. Above about 32.5%, the water was separated from the soil, so we didn't look at it you know, for that range. And as you can see, we had a nice uh, linear response. And we published this work in a journal back in uh, 2012. <clears throat> Another application was a, a wireless Haybill curing status sensor suite. Now, as most people in here probably know, uh, freshly cut hay needs to dry below about 20% moisture content before baling. Otherwise, you have a real risk of developing hay bale fires. Um, if the moisture content is above about 20%, then you, it starts to heat up. Part of that's because you get exothermic respiration in, in living plant cells that are in the hay. And part of that's because you have bacteria that like in hot conditions. Uh, Mesophila bacteria will survive up to about 60 degrees C. Thermophile bacteria uh, will survive well beyond that. And once you get it to about 82 degrees C, you can get spontaneous combustion of the hay. And that's a big problem in the US, and I'm sure it's a problem here too. So we developed a sensor suite that would do that. We used one of my moisture content sensors and integrated into that a temperature sensor. And connected that with a uh, microcontroller that has a Wi-Fi interface. Put that in a housing with uh, batteries, resulting in this prototype right here. Now, my grad students kind of refer to that as the pipe bomb. But it's, it's not really a pipe bomb, but it, it does fit nicely into the hay. Uh, this is one of my uh, former PhD students. Uh, he's probably about 25 there. People say he looks like he's about 14. So I could sell this as come to grad school and he won't age. 
Um, I'm trying to get more grad students. And he, he finished his doctorate about four or five years ago. So um, basically the, the product, you put it in the hay bale and it communicates the moisture content and temperature of the farmer's cell phone over about the six week uh, curing time. The actual sensor is only about that big. The rest of that are the C-size batteries it takes to power for six weeks of continuous operation. Uh, it's very low cost. Um, we developed an app for it on your phone, and I apologize, but U.S. farmers want Fahrenheit, so that's why it's a Fahrenheit. And we, this was tested during the winter, which is why it's below freezing there. Uh, but it basically will send that every time you ping it. And it can warn you if the conditions are such that it's a risk of a fire. So we, we published some of this work back in 2018. Another application was measuring the moisture content of stored grains. So for that, we developed a large, relatively large uh, PCB capacitive sensor for doing that. Uh, one of the nice things about printed circuit boards is you can get them very large compared to MEMS devices. So for applications where you've got relatively large items you're working with like bulk kernels of corn, it's real advantage over MEMS technology. So for this, we, we took corn kernels and we soaked them in tap water at room temperature for 24 hours. And every six hours in the 24 hour soak, we would take the corn uh, kernels off, out, dry them off. It's a good task for graduate students. Uh, then measure, measure uh, we had 50 we selected and marked that were representative ones inside a much larger uh, bulk. Uh, individually measure the mass of each one of those as they imbibe the water and then measure the bucket uh, capacitance and then put it back in to continue the soak. And then we compared the sensor capacitance with the mass of the kernels as they imbibe the water and got a linear correlation. So there's capacitance versus average kernel weight. Um, and uh, you know, from that, we could basically back, you know, determine how much water the corn kernels have had imbibed. And one of the things we noticed is, and there's actually a photograph of the test set up while we're testing the sensor. Uh, we observed there was a significant variation in the individual kernels between size, shape, and imbibing characteristics. So there's a, a lot of scatter in the data, but nevertheless, a discernible trend. And one of the things that also came out of that and we did as a further study was we noticed there is a orientation dependence on how you place the sensor in bulk corn to measure the moisture content. Uh, the corn kernel shape results in a sensor orientation dependence because Cord uh, kernels tend to orient such as to minimize their potential energy. And but what that means is basically the side with the largest area tends to, to fall and remain such that it's normal to the direction of gravity. So in other words, looking down at, at the beaker, they, they tend to arrange like that. Obviously, all of them don't, but a lot of them do, enough to where it affects how you place the sensor. And if you place the sensor into the form horizontally, it has a much higher sensitivity than if you place it vertically. And this one actually uh, shows change in capacitance versus moisture content. Uh, for the, the first study, that was a study I worked on with NASA, and they were interested basically in, you know, how does you know, grain change if it's, say, stored in the space station. Whereas here, we're looking at more agricultural applications. So we basically measure the moisture content uh, with an RF moisture content meter commercial for that. And uh, I would like to go through at some point and do some further studies where I look at other crops such as soybeans, which tend to be rounder, or, or maybe rice, where this may be even more, uh, more of an issue. And we, we published this fairly recently too. Another area this sensor works with is for electrochemical impedance spectroscopy or EIS. Uh, dissolved ions in water form uh, large hydration spheres. That mechanically they, they behave like a spring mass damper system, and, they have a, and as a result, they have a characteristic resonant frequency. And hydration spheres are they're sensitive electrically because water is a dipole molecule, and they will basically vibrate if electric energy is supplied at the resonant frequency. And uh, basically, if you change electrical properties of the solution, it will change that frequency accordingly. And of course, that also depends on the ion species and the concentration. So I, developed, I took one of these sensors and put it in a, an aqueous solution and then swept it over a wide frequency range. And that reveals a plot that you can use to identify what your chemistry is. So uh, here is the sensor for that. And that should look very similar to the sensor I passed around, uh, except I've added the University of Aikido logo on it. 
Um, once again, I like to reuse sensors for new applications. And to evaluate this one, I caged it up to a, a, an Agilent network analyzer and swept it between 100 kilohertz and 50 megahertz. And this particular sensor was designed so it fits in those Nalgene water bottles I like to use to test samples in. And that's a photograph of the test setup. So the first test I did was get to get a lot of different aqueous solutions and see, is there any difference? And uh, this is capacitance versus frequency for a bunch of different uh, solutions. Uh, TAP is tap water, AMSU is ammonium sulfate fertilizer in water. PO is water from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, bleach is, is a bleach water solution. And I got rain to still water. SS is water from the salt and sea. The salt and sea is a hypersaline, very polluted uh, inner sea in Eastern California. So out there, we got a sample of that. Uh, 10, 10, 10 is 10, 10, 10 fertilizer and water, the is ionized water and ammonia, some ammonia water um, solution. And what you see here is that you get these characteristic signatures where you've got a, a, a peak magnitude and peak frequency. And basically that changes based upon the chemistry. Now, you, this is not like a mass spec where you can determine everything that's in it, but if you have some idea of what the solutions you're looking at, you could use this to look for changes. Now, where I applied this was to look at uh, measuring nitrates in solution. Um, so I, we prepared a, a number of different nitrate solutions in deionized water. Uh, we looked at potassium nitrate, ammonium nitrate, and sodium nitrate, and all had similar characteristics. Uh, this is the evaluation of potassium nitrate in DI water from concentrations of zero, 160 parts per million. And what you see is you get a, a series of peaks. So as the concentration goes up, your peak magnitude decreases and so does the uh, frequency. And that makes sense in that the peak would decrease because you've got basically a higher damped, if you think about it as a mechanical system, higher damped mechanical system. And as the hydration shells uh, get larger, you basically have a lower frequency because the mass is higher. So from that, we could back up characteristic equations where you could, you could determine the uh, concentration, in this case of potassium nitrate, is either a function of that resonant peak frequency or of its magnitude. So with this type of, of sensor, you could go through, if you know some other things about your environment, calibrate the temperature, and you could measure how much nitrate is present. Another application of the same sensor is for detecting ice or icing conditions. Uh, water and ice have a large dielectric constant below uh, what's called the dielectric relaxation frequency. And, uh, uh, but it has a small dielectric constant above the, de the uh, dielectric relaxation frequency. Now for water, that, that frequency is about 10 gigahertz, so it's very high. However, for ice, it's approximately three kilohertz and as the temperature of ice falls, it actually goes down further. So what we did is with the sensor is we measure the capacitance at one kilohertz and at 64 kilohertz and then compute the ratio. And we discover if the ratio is greater than two, then it's in ice. And if it's less than two, then it's in water. So we tested that with uh, water and ice over a range, um, ice down to minus 30 C and water up to 34 C and also dry conditions. And in every one of those, if it's ice, your ratio is greater than two. And if it's dry or wet, then it's less than two. So this is a very handy way of detecting ice. And one of the goals, let's see if I can back up here. One of the goals is eventually is to come up with an RFID tag with a sensor on it that you put on a bridge and say a truck or a car goes by there, it can tell you if there's icing on the bridge. So that's, that's one of the goals for this eventual. And the last one of the three is insulated planar inductor sensors. Uh, this basically use a planar inductor that generates a 3D magnetic field around it. And if there's a ferromagnetic material that, that interacts with that 3D magnetic field, that will tend to increase the inductance. Uh, however, if it is a, a solid metallic structure that's ferromagnetic, you also get eddy currents which tend to decrease the inductance. But if your uh, ferromagnetic material is granular, 
uh, then basically there, there's not much to look at any currents. You actually see an increase in inductance. If you put a non-conductive uh, or a, a conductive non-ferromagnetic material, say aluminum in there, then you'll get a decrease in inductance due to the eddy currents in the material. And some work that, that I did with Rachel here um, about a year ago was to see if we could detect uh, iron-based rust in sand. And this was for applications in coastal regions where you had a very corrosive environment. You might also have iron or steel-based structures that might tend to rust. Uh, when you have iron corrosion products, they primarily consist of flakes of iron with weakly ferromagnetic uh, ferric oxide, which is the red rust that we're all familiar with. So for that, uh, developed a um, little PD, uh, PCB sensor with a little planar inductor structure in it. So we tested that in a variety of, uh, of, of ferric oxide and rust samples. And we observed was that between 0% uh, rust up to about 75% rust concentration in sand. You got a nice linear increase, then after that it saturates. So with this, you could very easily detect that you're getting rust in, in, in say, a beach environment. And we published on that uh, last year. Now, one last thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, which is a little bit slightly different, is a unit called the Gator Bite. And uh, this is a water quality mapping buoy that was developed for locating watershed pollution sources. And it's similar to the one that some of you guys worked on, uh, just you know, done in parallel without knowledge of either, either the person working on it. Um, it's basically, it's got temperature, pH, EC, and dissolved oxygen sensors. It has an arduinic microcontroller. It does GPS mapping. Um, sensor readings and GPS locations are time stamped, and it's got cellular connectivity. And it's in a 3D printed house. Basically, you put it in a, a river or a stream, it will float down and collect data real time. And the uh, point of contact for this is Dr. Evan Bean at the University of Florida. And uh, he said he would love to work with you guys on, on this. And he came to me and wanted to look at seeing if we could integrate some of my sensors into it to augment its capability on future iterations of it. And my involvement with that one, though, was in testing. Um, back in April of 2022, uh, even came to Auburn and we did some testing in Chihuahua Creek. And that actually runs by my property. So right there, we're putting it in on my property. Uh, it went down a couple kilometers past other property into the state park that we got permission to do sampling in. And that's it basically floating down. And we were collecting data real time. And that one was actually presented in 2022 at a conference. So in conclusion, multiple environmental sensing applications exist, and many of these applications can benefit from low-cost sensors. And I believe that print circuit board technology allows you to make low-cost sensors for those applications. And I believe that they're low enough in cost and sufficiently accurate for um, applications such, such as where you need a lot of, of deployed sensors or for one-time one use laboratory applications or anything else where they can just be disposable. So thank you very much, and I'd love to answer any questions. Sorry, perhaps I missed it. Your gator bite looks awesome. Is it telemetered, or basically do you have to follow it? Like, could it get lost in the trees on the side of the bank, or does it just sort of... Well, we followed it down. He actually he put waders on it, followed it in the water. The rest of us just kind of followed to make sure he, he was okay. Um, it did get stuck in some eddies. You have to go and kind of push it out of there. I think once it, there were some limbs hanging in, it got stuck. So, but it sends you its location. Where oh, it, it does? Is. Yes. Yeah, it's connected to your cell phone and just, it, it sends you where it is. So but how you, close would you have to be to get that? Oh, uh, well, what's with the cellular network? As long as there's a oh, cellular network, network, I mean, you could be many kilometers away and still talk with it. Oh, awesome. And it also has a, um, a, like an SD card on it in case it loses connectivity, so it stores the data. A uh, interesting kind of dangerous story. Uh, our state park is right next to a limestone quarry. And of course, they pumped the water out of it. That caused a bunch of sinkholes. They ended up having to close off part of the park. A big lawsuit resulted. And um, the creek kind of goes along there around the closed part of the park. And myself and some other faculty members were along the banks just to make sure nothing bad happened. I mean, it's April. 
we have venomous snakes. I'm like, you guys, we have alligators. Um, he disappeared. And we were getting kind of concerned. And we found him later, he was completely soaked. He had stepped into a sinkhole in the creek. So he went from being like waist deep to well over his head. But he think he was able to get out because we just, we wouldn't have any idea where he was. So, but he basically was his baby. He followed it down to make sure it didn't get stuck or lost or anything. How much would it cost to put one of those together? I would have to ask him about that. Everything was off the shelf except they 3D printed the, um, uh, you know, the housing there. His goal was to make them very inexpensive so a lot of people would have them. And I believe he set this up to where everything is open source too. Any other questions? I've got a question. Um, so you mentioned the, the clay on, and the soil composition of the um, interdigitated um, electrode. Um, do silt and sand contents also matter in terms of sensor calibration? I would say probably not. If you had a lot of iron content in your soil, that, that might affect it. Okay. Um, but no, as far as the silica content, I don't think that would affect it very much. Question for you. So, what about the calibration of your sensors? Because obviously, you're getting a lot of data back. Yeah, what I try to do is purchase commercial sensors and use those to calibrate them. They're pretty no dramas at all. Yes. Yes. The other question was in terms of the. Um, uh, I did. I think you mentioned on your conclusions that they're quite sort of for disposable field use. So, how you know they're going? Some of them going to quite harsh environments, and you've got them on a PCB. Is what their sort of longevity? If you sort of stuck one of these into soil or um, water or whatever, you sort of found. We have that some, we have some, done some soil testing for them um, long term, and they seem to work pretty well there. And um, in fact. Some of the commercial uh, manufacturers now of soil moisture content sensors use printed circuit boards, so that they will work for that application. Um, I have done some tests where I did immersion of the sensors in seawater to see does it affect the metal and so forth. And um, the, the, the tin plate did help as well as the gold plate. What was the, the low-end sensitivity of your nitrate sensor? <laughs> uh, well, let me back up a bit. Uh, for this test, the lowest that we measured was the um, 10 parts per million. Um, but it would, the peak dropped significantly between that and DIO water, so we could definitely go lower than that. Um, kind of on the same kind of scale of things, um, is there an idea? So, a lot of the tests seem to be. You take the sensor and you um, use it for um, to kind of collect data from a sample. Um, so, are there are there ideas of having like um, sensor arrays for um, site for field sites and kind of using them like that? Yes, uh, there there are plenty of ideas for that. Uh, let me point out, with the exception of the hay belt sensor. The rest of these were all done, I funded them myself, all with internal funding. Okay. So getting a sensor and doing some tests with one is really cheap. If I want to do a large fielded one, there that requires you know, larger amounts of money, like an extra grant for that. So yeah, in my country, if you're not doing work that's like directly applicable to the Department of Defense, it's hard to get funding. <laughs> and most of this they don't really care about. So but you know, for me. I enjoy it. It's it's innovative. It's interesting. I can get lots of publications on it. Yes. For your rust sensor, what caused the saturation? Do you think? 
That's a real good question. I'm not sure, but it was consistent among a lot of tests. Um, I don't know if you're, it could be you're getting enough material there to where it's like saturating the core. You're getting the numbing effects of that. I'm not really sure what caused that, but it, but it was consistently observable. But, but do, you, do you need to read to the third decimal place to get the, to the measurement? So that means you are doing, have to take the sample into the lab to do measurement. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, if I wonder, uh, I took these in, well, these were all lab repaired samples that I did. I mean, the, you know, the goal would be to use it, you know, at, in the field, but for verifying that it works, I, you know, I tested it in a laboratory. Question. So, because um, obviously every single sensor would have to be calibrated, have you done characterization of sensors over from the same facility within the same batch, across batches, across facilities to see whether you need to do this calibration individually or as long as the design is the same, our manufacturing processes are sufficient that the tolerances are really tight? Um, it depends on the sensor. The, the EC sensors. I've done multiple ones of those and get the same results. For the Frenching field, excuse me, for the Frenching field sensors, there is some calibration needed, but they're really easy to calibrate. I mean, if, if you put them in, in air and then DI water, and you can calibrate them very quickly. So you can, and by adding a temperature sensor, you can easily calibrate out temperature effects. So they're, they're not difficult to calibrate. But they really need to, some of them do need to be individually calibrated. If you want a really precise reading, yes. If you're looking, you know, for thresholds, then you probably don't. Yes. If you can tell us, is there a sensor that doesn't exist yet that would be ideal, that would work with um, PCB technology that, um, if that would be the next kind of amazing um, environmental uh, monitoring, environmental research device? Or is that still something that you're working on? I, I don't know the answer uh, to that. That would, that would kind of be like, you know, what is needed for the environmental side? Because, you know, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer that dabbles in environmental science and geology and these other, and weather in these other areas. Um, I just look for, I look for applications to apply the sensor technology to. So if someone has an application, let me know what that is, and I can I can think about and I build a sensor that works for that. Anybody else? Well, um, so we as part of ERI would be uh, very are very grateful of you um, participating in our seminar series and. Um, Great, thank you. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll get a whistle off the screen. I get back. Oh, sure.